and get in here and share the screen real quick and hopefully everybody can see it and hear it and all that kind of fun stuff and move some windows around here because every time you touch something in zoom it moves 62 things for you so hopefully everybody is seeing a screen that says advanced driver assistance systems ADAS and it'll say seminar two cameras and sensors and since I can see uh, uh, Mike's face there in his car uh, if you give me a thumbs up Mike if you can see it all right so just because you come up in the picture that's uh, you're my new guy to go to uh, so welcome back everybody thanks you uh, for coming uh, hopefully you got something out of last week and uh, we'll continue to build on what we've been doing We'll continue to build on what we were doing from last week. Uh, last week was really an introduction to where we can find the curriculum materials. Um, they're free for you to use. Uh, there's also the Bosch materials there as well. Um, there are some two different sets of PowerPoints that are going to end up there. Uh, the original ones that are there are very skeletal and they were built so that people could build from. And then there'll be these enhanced ones that are going up there uh, as we finish these different classes and they're available to you. Um, nothing's locked down on them. You can do what you like with them. Um, the only thing I would say is, you know, let's keep them off of YouTube and things like that so that, uh, you know, somebody doesn't freak out on that stuff. Um, but otherwise, it's gonna take us about an hour and a half. Uh, there's a fair amount of stuff to talk about with this one. And the biggest thing that we're trying to do with all these is, is introduce everybody to the technologies. Uh, through a lot of the meetings we've been having, uh, we've found that this is a big area where people just aren't that sure, uh, whether it's they don't have experience with the cars, they don't have exposure to the cars. Um, it's just not something that they've wanted to take the time on, whatever the case may be, but uh, it is kind of the new reality for us. And it is not really new technologies. I mean, many of these things have been around for almost 20 years now in a lot of different vehicles. So let's keep moving forward then. All right, so meeting guidelines. Essentially, try to keep the questions in the chat. We start getting some of the mic questions going and, and that's okay, it's, it's great and it adds to the conversation. Uh, it's not to prevent a comment or ignore anybody's input. It's just trying to maximize, maximize the time because there's a lot of people on these and there's a lot of conversations that could happen real quick. Uh, remember, your knowledge, your experience may be different. Uh, if you've been 20 years with Mercedes-Benz, hey, Mercedes-Benz may call things differently. They may do things differently. They may have some different processes. These are all built generically. You're going to see a lot of different information, a lot of different vehicles, a lot of different tools and equipment that are shown. But if in your school, you've got a manufacturer affiliation and you have a vehicle, you have information, you have a particular piece of equipment, use that primarily use that primarily because you have a lot more depth and contact than you're going to have on the generic. But when you don't have stuff, hey, lean on the generic or throw the generic in there every now and then just for exposure because you never know where that student's actually going to end up uh, employment-wise. So uh, like Pam mentioned, please make sure you put your uh, name and your school up in the chat so that, uh, you know, for the college faculty, you get paid all that kind of fun stuff and everybody can get certificates at the end of all this in August. So today we're going to talk about cameras. We're going to talk about radar sensors, LIDAR sensors, and ultrasonic sensors. And hopefully everybody's familiar with ultrasonic because it's been around a long time. And there are Q&A spots that will stop. And we'll run through the chat in that spot after each topic. If you weren't here last week, um, we started out with going through where to find this curriculum and stuff. It's been one of the common things that's come up in all the different meetings we've had is where can I get to this information that everybody says there's access to. Um, in the chat, there is a link to the ATL website, and this is where it all lives. From the main page, you would click on faculty, and then the curriculum tab, and all of this material is under the new ADAS advanced driver assistance. So you'll see the materials from these sessions. You'll see the Bosch materials um, for ADAS and some other things that Bosch has up there. There's some white papers that gives you a lot more depth and detail on how some of these sensors work and systems work. Um, the Bosch PowerPoint for uh, ADAS is very good. 
it'll go a lot deeper into the sensors and the cameras and things, but it'll also go into multiple ADAS systems. He's got quite a few um, calibration videos up there as well for your access and use. Um, there is also tasks. There is eight generic built tasks that support for the ADAS instruction. And the reason they're generic built is that way, no matter what car you have, they'll fit and you could give the same task, say a, a component identification and location sheet. You could give that to every student in the class and have them do it on not just cars that are in your shop, but even cars online to be able to go research and reference that information. So it, everything's just a foundation piece to go from. So let's start with cameras. Now cameras are a big deal for us because we're using them a lot. And essentially what we've got to transition to is when we have a human driver, the human is the, the central point for spatial awareness. Whether it is sound, it is sight, it is smell, it is taste, you are that input device and you are controlling all those outputs, whether it's brake steering or acceleration. As we transition into the ADAS systems and autonomous and semi-autonomous and things like that, cameras, sensors, all of those things become that spatial awareness. So the cameras become a really critical part of what's going on. Don't be afraid to ask your students. Um, I've had students who work quality control in dealerships. So they're driving cars with these systems. They're getting exposure to them. Maybe the student has a newer car and has it on their own car or their parents' car, or a car you have. So lean on them. Help get that conversation going. Don't be afraid to have the conversation. Do you think it's good or bad? Because there's a whole extreme on, are they good and are they bad? So I like to start presentations with a video clip. And the reason I do that is if the students didn't do any reading, they have no point of reference to go from, by giving them a video, and usually a short video, gives them some introduction to that system, gives them some awareness of that system. And that way, when you start into it, there's a point of reference to build from. So this next video, it is not a car camera based video, but it is a camera based video. That's what matters. I'm not getting any sound card. Kurt, you may have to change your microphone. Yeah, I'm going to pause it there because I just found out that it didn't have it. So I got to go into the sharing here real quick. It should have been there. Let me go back onto that. Okay. And I'm going to back it up. Brit Wavelength. I'm Courtney Cox Darquette, lead camera person Not on set. Good. This camera here is one you're likely to see in any production studio you visit. The way this camera works is pretty simple. Light enters the camera through the lens. That light then hits the charge coupled device and then converts the light information into an image. Now inside of the body of this camera, there are actually three CCD sensors. are three because to be able to process and redistribute color information it has to measure light at three separate wavelengths that's one for each primary color red green and blue so in order to do this a prism block is used to separate the image being captured into the reds the greens and the blues because of how the prism is assembled each of the three colors gets its own charge coupled device that means the CCD is able to devote all of its pixels to that particular color channel an advantage to using CCD is the resolution. Even though a CCD sensor uses a lot of time and energy converting each pixel, it can hold a large amount across its surface. However, a downside to CCD is what's called the blooming or smearing effect. This happens when a light gathering pixel exceeds its capacity to hold captured photons. That excess spills over into the adjacent pixels and can produce a spike of light in the air. 
There are other options when recording video. For instance, the cameras you use to record Snapchat videos on your cell phone uses a CMOS sensor. Though they record less resolution than a CZD, CMOS won't cause blooming or smearing. To get a better idea of what CMOS sensors are, meet Charles at the CMOS Institute. Hello, I'm Charles Moss from the CMOS Institute, and today I'll be talking about CMOS sensors. Let's get started. CMOS, which stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor, is the sensor that can be found in most cell phones, web cameras, and DSLRs. Let's look at how these sensors work. First, light enters through the lens and is directed to the CMOS sensor. A primary color filter sits on top of the sensor that divides the light into red, green, and blue. The sensor converts the light into an electric signal, which is then in turn converted into a digital signal. This signal then carries and imprints images on whichever storage device is being used. CMOS sensors generally work faster than CCD sensors and require less power to operate. They are also cheaper to manufacture and more compact, making them ideal to include into consumer products. Another advantage of the CMOS sensor is that, because they capture each pixel individually, they don't have the same blooming and smearing problem that CCDs have. One of the main drawbacks of using CMOS sensors is what's called the rolling shutter effect. They scan images the same way we read books, moving from left to right, line by line. This creates problems when trying to capture fast-moving subjects or panning the camera while shooting, as it can create a distorted and inaccurate representation of what is being captured. So, with that video, it gives you that quick introduction to what the different types of a quote digital camera are. And with that, you could already ask a student, what type of camera system, whether CMOS or CCD, would you think would be in a car? Well, if they said a CMOS, you say, well, isn't there a lot of fast moving things going on? We're driving this vehicle. It doesn't have a lot of time to read the sign or see the lines. If it was a CMOS, it would struggle. So the cars were running CCD. So that's an easy way to take that video and start to utilize that for the discussion for the class in it. And yeah, they're talking about TV cameras. So what? The CMOS and the CCD works the same in the cars. So building from that video, you know, what does it do? It's going to convert light waves into electrical signals. Why do we have it? It provides that spatial awareness. It's the <clears throat> eyes for the car. So if you're not looking, it still is. What kind of benefits would we get from it? Well, if there's more eyes, there's more things aware, less chance of accidents, lower injuries. Hey, we're gonna speed up traffic. And this becomes those steps towards autonomous vehicles. How are we gonna use them? Hey, we're gonna take that information and we're gonna share it with different systems that are either gonna provide us with some sort of a uh, audio or visual or feel feedback to alert us, or maybe even integrate it with a more advanced system that can actually make a corrective action because of it. And we already see these things, whether it's the lane keep that we talked about last week, or it might even be a pedestrian awareness type of things to where, hey, it sees a pedestrian. Now we start readying up the brake system for an emergency braking if we need to. So there's these overlaps with these systems. Camera operation. Well, the video did a great job explaining what's happening. So it's taking the light that's bouncing off of all of us. It's focusing it through an optic. It's taking that optic and breaking those signals down through a CCD device that device is gonna provide a voltage amount. So if it's a green, a red, a blue, shades of each, it's gonna provide a voltage to uh, amount associated with that. It's then gonna get processed. As it goes through that processing, it creates that digital picture. Now, it's not gonna see a picture like your eyes. It's not gonna see a picture like you would take with a camera. It's seeing the ones and O's. Okay, we're back to thinking like a computer. We're back to binary. So it's taking that binary image and it's now either going to process it directly. So newer cameras, the modules in the camera, older cameras, it might've been a separate module that it transmitted to. 
And then depending on what needs to happen and what systems are involved, that's when it goes and makes its um, presence felt. Some of the older cameras were connected through a low voltage differential signaling or LVDS. Um, it was its own type of little bus system. A lot of the newer cameras are using ethernet. And the reason for the ethernet, it's higher speed, higher volume. And when we're talking driving down the road, we need a, a higher volume of information processed by the cameras to make it usable. So what kind of systems might we be utilizing for cameras? So this is an area where that question back to the students, what do you think would use a camera? Well, lane departure, we know that. How about rear view cameras? We don't wanna throw cameras out the window just because they're in the front. Hey, we got rear view cameras. Those have been around for a long time. If you're around Tesla's, there's cameras in the B pillars on a lot of the news of cars. We even had cameras under the outside rear view mirrors on some vehicle for blind spot detections. So we can use cameras in a lot of places. You're even seeing some of these newer systems use cameras inside the car shooting at the driver's face so that we can see if they're starting to get drowsy for drowsiness detection. So a lot of different applications. There's one key important thing to remember with cameras, white light blinds cameras. Essentially bright light, whether you look into a, a light bulb or you look into the sun, it has so many different colors in it at the same time that essentially it just overloads. So what do you see? Nothing. Well, same scenario for a camera. If a camera is driving into direct sunlight, it can't see. If it's blinded by oncoming lights because the cars are way out of adjustment, it can't see. If it can't see, it's not gonna provide the services and the functions that it needs to happen. Camera types. So we originally started out seeing single cameras up on that windshield area. So the upper picture on the right, Originally, you just started seeing one camera and typically it was being used for lane departure and things like that. It just, it was very limited on what all it was doing. What we've started to see more and more is a second camera or dual or stereo cameras come into play because now it can give us a better picture. It can watch the road lines better. We can use it for pedestrian uh, protection or recognition much better. And then we've got a lot of other sensors on that windshield, whether it's a rain sensor, which is basically a prism type sensor. It's bouncing a small little red light across a, a prism. And if there's a drop of water on the glass, it will hit that drop of water and deflect some of that light. It, the other side of that sensor is gonna measure how much light returns. The less the light returns, the more water is on the windshield. We also have automatic high beam sensors or basically just uh, photo cells. And again, a photo cells, nothing more than a resistor that's gonna change resistance based on the amount of light. And you might see a photo cell looking both forward and up because as you get into more of the automatic headlights, the reason that you'll have the forward is to recognize oncoming lights. That's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. But why do you think they would have one looking up? You ever drive through a tunnel? And what they found with a lot of automatic headlights is cars would go into some of these short tunnels and the headlights would be flickering on and off because they'd be in the short tunnel. They'd turn on because they wouldn't see ambient light. And then all of a sudden it would see ambient light and it would turn them on when it was in the tunnel or turn it off when it was out of the tunnel. And you get some places in the world that actually have like skylights in their tunnels and the lights would flutter on and off as they go through the tunnel as it picks up ambient light and forward light. So those things are all going on in the windshield. So we do have a lot of applications. Again, we might have had some on the outside rear view mirrors for blind spot detection. We're seeing them in things like the fender corners. Uh, so the middle picture on the left is one that's about the emblem area behind the front wheel. Uh, we've seen them on the rear car for a long time for reverse uh, cameras, but we now see you know, Tesla using cameras in the B pillars. So all of these come into play and we start to overlap more and more of these in the use of the vehicle overall for what we call sensor fusion. We'll talk more about that. Okay. Now I'm 
magic button, there we go. So camera diagnosis. One of the key things with any of these ADAS systems is we've really got to get the, the students to understand everything starts with a visual inspection. Everything. Duplicate the complaint, that's still there. Checking for fault codes, that's still there. But as soon as I've duplicated it, I need to be looking for signs of damage. And some of those signs of damage may be really obvious, so a broken windshield, let's say. But maybe they had a windshield replaced and they damaged the camera on the installation. So if you're actually looking in there and you might see the, the lens damaged or see something on the lens, maybe they had some of the goo squish out and get onto the lens, or maybe there's a piece of paper up in there or whatever. We've got to start getting used to a visual inspection becomes a really critical part with ADAS systems. Body repair, signs of body damage with certain things are going to create a bigger problem. Uh, maybe that Tesla was in a wreck and the B pillar got knocked off a little bit. Well, that side camera is not going to work right anymore. Any different than if the trunk lid or a rear gate was damaged from a rear collision, the rear camera is not going to work correctly. If your camera doesn't work correctly, that's going to change the parking assist lines in the rear of the vehicle when you go to back up. You know, things may not be as close as they appear in the camera, or they may be a lot closer. So visual inspection becomes a huge part. Uh, checking fault codes. Right now, the aftermarket scan tools for ADAS are really no different than they are for the OBD2 side of things. Some tools cover a lot of systems. Some cool tools cover very few systems they're probably going to have more than one scanner to cover all the different systems. If you've got an OEM tool, hey, that's going to be the best thing. And yeah, you should be able to check all the systems with that factory tool. Even if you don't have that, it still comes down to some basics. It's got to have power. It's got to have ground. It's going to have some sort of a signal. So as we get into these systems, the realization starts to really set in that, hey, our students need to have a higher electrical level as they come into these vehicles. They've got to be able to do all their basic electrical testings with the DVOM, but the scan tool is going to be a piece of it, but the oscilloscope is probably going to be a really big piece because how else are you going to check that bus signal? Yeah, you can use a, a DVOM and get that average, but are you seeing communication? We've got to see communication, even if we can't necessarily read it, we've got to confirm that we have it. That's a big part of our diagnostics on these systems. It's, it's module to module. Weather conditions. Weather conditions are going to be something across the board. It doesn't matter what the system is. It doesn't matter what the, whether it's a camera or a radar. Weather is going to impact all of this. So if I've got really heavy rain, that camera is not going to see as well. If it's got snow, sleet, hail, it's not going to see as well. It's not going to see as well in the fog. It's not going to see as well in heavy smoke or dust. So if you can't see, it can't see. It might see a little better than you, but that same things that impact the driver's vision impact the system's visions. So all of these things need to be taken into consideration as they're doing diagnosis on these systems. And it's a good thing to be able to spur that conversation with the students. What kind of things do you think would be a problem? And let them throw them out there. And then sometimes they may throw something crazy out there and you say, well, stop and think about it. How would that impact this? We also have to consider, has the vehicle been modified? We've got our infamous blue BMW in the picture again. And when we start changing altitude, whether we go up or down, that starts changing that visual window that the sensor, or in this case, the camera is looking through. We change that window, it may or may not see what it should see the way it should see it. And that's gonna affect how the system operates. And again, if it was a rear view camera or a side view camera, it doesn't matter. You've changed that angle of operation. Kurt, may I mention something about the yeah. dysfunction of that? Sure. So, um... Uh, it's happened to me today on the road when I was going out and my, um, my rain sensor, there was no rain, but it was the, the shadow and light from the forest was flickering on my windshield and also my windshield wipers went. And it's the second time that in the same place where I noticed that. Yeah, that's weird. Because yeah. usually it has to have something on the glass to deflect it. Uh -huh. So maybe it's a dead bug that's kind of splatted there. 
And when okay. it gets that light, sh you know, the ambient light shutter just happens to give enough deflection. It also depends on the car. Um, some cars with automatic wipers, you actually have to turn them on or enable them to be in an automatic mode. Some of them are default off until you do that. Some of them may have a, a thing where they're going to be on whether you turn it on or not. Um, that could be the difference of different vehicles. But yeah, you can get some weird stuff with these different sensors. And hey, let's think about this. What if they put an aftermarket windshield in? An aftermarket windshield could have a greater thickness, a thinner thickness, a different border. Um, on the prisms, a lot of the time the aftermarket windshields didn't have the prism, the prism for the rain light sensor, which is typically on the glass itself. And they would cut that off the old glass and try to glue it onto the new glass. <laughs> uh, if I had an extra little air bubble between that, between the glass and that prism, that's another point of deflection. So you're going to see OEM parts become a bigger and bigger issue with all of these things. And for body shops, paint thicknesses are going to be huge when we start talking about radar and things like that. So the aftermarket industry is getting challenged a little bit because of these factory things. The insurance companies are being challenged a little bit because they don't want to pay for that factory glass if they don't have to. But if you've got these systems, they're going to have to put that in for it to work, but your premiums are going to be more. So there's all these trade-offs with all this stuff. Cameras for service and calibration, uh, similar discussion to what we had with last week. A lot of the early systems, purely mechanical. You would set them up, you'd get the targets going, you take them through their uh, calibration process. Some of the later ones had a self system or a dynamic system to where you would take it out, you'd put it in a test mode, you would drive it, and then it would eventually learn and you would hope and pray it learned and then way back you come. Some have both, some have mechanical settings that you then need to drive but the newer systems are going more and more towards the mechanical because the driving conditions are extremely difficult to get to do all the calibrations with, you know, markets like our Bay Area or Southern California or New York or whatever. You just can't drive the vehicle in the conditions you need to be able to get that to happen. So the calibration comes into play. When it comes to your shop or your school, you know, some things to think about. Do you have an automotive and a collision program. If you do, do you need two target assemblies? No, buy one. Maybe even spin its own class to where you're pulling students from both sides or bring them all into one class or the other because the application for them is, is critical for the body shop as it is for the technicians. If you've got a heavy duty program, partner in with the automotive program or the collision program to share those costs and resources. If you're in a multi-school district, and the schools are within a reasonable distance, it might be worth it to have um, a shared unit to where, yeah, you've made the investment and through scheduling, you schedule it to be at campus X for certain dates and campus Y for different dates and campus Z for different dates so that all the programs can benefit from that equipment because it's, it's on wheels. It's very portable. You can move it around in a pickup truck uh, pretty easily but it saves you spending twenty to $25,000 for every campus site. So there's different ways to, to address it. And even if you're not gonna get cars for your site or even get the equipment for your site, you can still take the students through these materials. And there is a ton of videos out there from Autel and others showing the calibrations of these different units and using them. Um, I mentioned it last week, Motor Age did a really good about two hour seminar that you can find on YouTube. Um, the link is embedded in the show notes for the presentation. And they could, you could make that a homework assignment now or make it a, an online lab now that we're gonna have a lot of online labs going on. So all of these things come into play. So let's take a look and see what kind of questions we have in here. Uh, possibly make students aware of drawbacks. Yeah, on the cameras, you could have some drawbacks because one, you've increased the cost of servicing, maintenance, um, repair costs, things like that, uh, but also things like sunlight, if they've done the window tints. Uh, for many, many years, you had the automatic mirrors, the ones that would self-tint. Well, they typically had a photo cell in the rearview mirror 
And when it saw bright headlights coming through the rear windshield, it picked that up and it would, you know, change the tint on the interior mirror and the exterior mirrors. Well, you tint the rear window and that light doesn't come through and the customer complains, hey, I'm, my, my mirrors don't tint anymore. Well, because you blinded them. So there's things that come with that, uh, direct sunlight, indirect sunlight. And one of the things we'll talk about when we get to autonomous is recently there was a, I think it was in Taiwan, there was a Tesla that drove into a flipped truck on the freeway. Well, that flipped truck was sitting at an angle and it was all white. Well, what do cameras not see well? White. Radar sensors should have picked it up, but what happens to radar? Well, radar shoots something out, it bounces back and it hits it. Well, the truck was at an angle, so maybe it was deflecting some, because eventually the car threw the brakes on, but it was just too late. So you could sit there and start to rationalize, okay, here's, here's could have what uh, could have been what happened with that system. So there's gonna be drawbacks with all of these systems, uh, but yeah and asking the students what drawbacks there might be. Um, Ed mentioned son's new Chevy truck has a camera in the tailgate, also has a sliding camper, temporary issues to be addressed in the future. <laughs> so yeah, and you're starting to see that with um, trucks especially, when they do the, the hitch in the factory wiring kit, as soon as you plug in, it disables things like park distance control sensors, otherwise they'd be going crazy the whole time while the, the trailer's connected. So there are some things built into some of the vehicles to recognize certain conditions, um, but other things may just go crazy if they're not that smart. Uh, Mark mentioned special windshields for heads up. Yes, most of the heads up display systems, at least the early systems, they used a triple pane of glass and a little bit of an angle, and that created the final mirror. What we're seeing on some of the newer cars is actually just a small plastic blade on top of the dashboard that becomes the projection point for the heads up display instead of hovering it in the glass or hovering it at the end of the uh, uh, hood line that we saw with BMW. Uh, Michael mentioned 2018 F-150 shuts off the rear camera and the bumper sensors for backup when he connects his car hauler. And you probably have to use the factory um, box for it to know that. You know, if you went to U-Haul or home wired it in, it may not have that trigger piece to know that that's going to do that. So now you're having to use some of the factory things. Maybe the aftermarket has come up with that as well. Uh, are there systems that integrate Navi with ADAS? Yes and no. Um, you're seeing Tesla's using uh, navigation and tied in with their ADAS and things like that. You see on some of the hybrids where they've tied navigation in with hybrid control. So it will actually maybe give more assist as you're climbing a hill because it knows it's a hill so that it has more room to regen coming down the hill. And, or you're coming into a city and it'll hold off on electrical use so that you can have more EV range in town. So they're definitely using it from a hybrid control side and probably an EV control side with the ADAS side, I'm not sure yet, but uh, some questions that I had asked because, you know, when we talk about diagnostics, weather conditions are huge. And the same problems that we see with cameras, we see in most cases with radar as well, and even LIDAR to some extent. So how are you going to have an autonomous vehicle that can't see because it's snowing and icy outside? Well, that wouldn't work. And when I asked uh, Steve Zach at Bosch, you know, how is this going to be addressed? Or, or do you only get to be autonomous part time? Um, he said, there's a new generation coming down the road. And I said, well, what is it? And he says, I can't tell you. Uh, right. uh -huh. I think, you, I think uh -huh. we're going to see a greater level of night vision come into play because it fills in some gaps. I think satellites, not just GPS navigation, but true satellite navigation is going to be a, play a bigger part and vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to grid communications are gonna play a bigger and bigger part of covering some of those gaps where sensors struggle. Uh, John Taylor, has anyone relocated their bumper sensors into a camper instead of the bumper? Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody hadn't tried it. Um, as long as it was at the right height and calibration, it, it should work, but you know, who knows? 
um, Ed Snyder, if I remember correctly, the original active cruise control radar signal did not register on a non-moving object, such as an overpass or an abatement. They do and they don't. And when we talk about radar here in another slide or two, I'll show you uh, some radar pickup. And you'll be amazed at what radar really sees. At that point, it becomes what does the algorithm utilize to do its job? So there's a lot more stuff going on with radar than uh, just seeing a particular thing. It's seeing everything. Okay. Any other questions on cameras? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Let me unmute myself. Hey, um, so I, I have this thing left over. This is a, a bus system, and I was just looking to see what a 2019 A8 would have. And it does have Ethernet, and it does have LVDS. And it seems to be um, most of the camera stuff is the LVDS. And then the uh, Ethernet is reserved for just a couple things. Uh, it was the um, laser. sorry, whatever laser module, but also to the data link connector. So they're giving Ethernet yeah. to the data link connector too. I guess so the scan tool can operate quickly too, right? Actually, it's for programming. Uh, we saw oh, okay. it, we saw it with BMW. Uh, they run Ethernet to all of the modules to speed up programming. Instead of programming over buses, it went to Ethernet. Uh, you will see, depending on the car, some of the ones I've researched, you'll even see some of the radar sensors on some vehicles that'll be on ethernet. And it's just, it's a speed thing. It's a speed and a volume thing. Um, the LVDS, it depends on what camera it's on too. So if I've got uh, stereo cameras, I'm probably working my way towards ethernet. If I've got a mono camera, I'm probably, you know, I just haven't evolved to the ethernet yet. I may still be on an LVDS. So we're in a big transition and, and reality is the technology that's here today it's going to be different in five years. It'll be far more advanced, much smaller, and work a million times faster. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to radar. So radar, it's another one of those spatial awarenesses. Again, we're trying to find ways to add to the awareness of the driver or in a semi-autonomous or autonomous vehicle, the awareness of the vehicle where it is and what's around it. Again, ask students what they know. You might have an ex-military student who was a, a radar guy on a submarine. Who knows? They may have some really good uh, answers to this stuff, or maybe they were in a body shop, or even on your own vehicles. Again, if you've got factory information, if you've got factory cars in your shop, focus this stuff towards that, because you'll have more depth, more information to use. So let's take a look at some of this uh, radar stuff. Now, this video does not have audio. And what it's going to show you is everything that's coming into the radar system. And it's actually going to give it to us across three different pictures. So once it gets done with its sales pitch here to giving you a little bit on the different sensors, there are different radar sensors. So the top left picture is looking forward from the car. The bottom left picture is like a dash cam. And the picture on the right is a sky view looking down. All those little green flakes, specks, dots, they're reds, there's blues, there's yellows. Those are all the radar returns. So that radar sensor is transmitting and every little return it gets, that's what's being shown on that screen as a dot. And you can see things like when that vehicle passed through or when the bicyclist goes across, you can see that that concentration of dots is much tighter and it's moving lateral as it's going across from it. But we'll see things at large distances as well. So this is, you're stopped at a stoplight in town. And it's gonna transition. Here's a nice big truck to come by for us. So now let's change the scenario a little bit. Now we've got a lot more moving cars. We've got a big bus sitting there on our left and we can start to see things if you look on the sky view picture or the picture on the top, where you see that green flutter, that green flutter, it's picking up the tree line next to the vehicle. And if you look at the range from the top down, it's picking up things in that 60 to almost 70 meter range, but the heaviest concentration is 30 meters or less. So this is probably our medium range or short range radar. When we're on the freeway and we're on like an active cruise control, now we're on a long range radar. 
And what we're looking at here from it is we're seeing distances that it's picking up returns at as much as 170 meters. And we'll see things uh, here shortly, it's gonna change lanes and we'll actually see it start to pick up the lane divider on our shoulder and things like that. It'll see the vehicles coming towards us and away from us. But at the same time, it's also gonna give project, uh, speed calculations. How fast is that vehicle going away from us? How fast is that vehicle coming at us if it was a radar signal? So the radar is looking at a lot of things. It's determining what it's going to use for the application it's in. So no different than the human driver who ignores things, sounds, smells, feels, because it's not relevant to the, where they're going at the moment. The radar systems, they still see it, but the processors and the algorithms ignore what's not important. And we'll see that advance even farther when we get into LIDAR and such. So what's radar? It's basically a device that's gonna send out an electrical pulse. It's gonna get a bounce back from that pulse as it's hit something, and it's gonna do calculations on that. It can figure out speed, direction, altitude, all of those things can be calculated from that information returning back to the radar. Why do we have it? Spatial awareness. What's around me? Same benefits that we saw, same kind of utilizations. So by now, we've talked about two different systems. Last week, we talked about lane departure, and we just started talking about cameras. Now we're talking about radar. And we can see a lot of these things are going to have repetitiveness to them. And that's how our students learn. The more we can repeat it to them. But it also gives us a point for them to start teaching us more. Okay, we've talked about this before. What do you think it could do? How do you think it can interact? So that's how we can use these in an instructional environment. So radar. Remember, we have two different kinds of radar. We have active radar that's going to send a signal and receive that signal. And we have passive radar, which is only going to receive a signal. Something else has to generate it. So all of our radar on the cars, we're active. We're sending and we're receiving. Basically, it's sending an electrical wave. That wave is going to go out at a specific frequency. It's going to hit something, like you see in the animation, that little yellow dot. It's hitting that spot. It's returning back to the sensor. The sensor's taking in that information, making calculations, and whatever system is going to utilize it as it needs. Radar is going to work pretty good in fog. It could work well in bright light. How well is it going to be in the snow, the slush, ice, things like that where you have heavy material floating past it in the air that could disrupt it? Well, it could be an issue. It does work well in those conditions where cameras start to have a gap. And that's the benefit. As these systems start to overlay each other, the strengths and weaknesses start to get cycled out a little bit. Okay. Now, where are we going to find these things? Well, typically we find radar behind the bumpers or inside the fender wells. So now when we start talking diagnostics, our body and collision stuff becomes a bigger issue. Uh, I found one Mercedes system where the sensors themselves are actually mounted to the bumper cover on the backside, not to the body structure, but to the plastic bumper cover. Well, what happens when that bumper cover gets knocked skewed a little bit? It's not going to read correctly. So all of these visual things that we've started to talk about become more and more, more and more important. So what kind of systems might use the radar? Well, active cruise control, uh, emergency braking, pedestrian protection, uh, lane, not so much lane departure, but blind spot detections, uh, rear collision avoidance, anything that wants, we want to have, you know, a virtual set of eyes without using a camera. So radar types, there's really two main types. There's Doppler, which essentially sends out a common signal or a common frequency. It's going to hit, it's going to return. The closer the object is, the faster the signal returns, the farther the object is, the longer it takes. Early radar that you saw in cars oftentimes was a Doppler. Most of the newer systems have gone to what's called a millimeter wave. The millimeter wave is a much shorter wavelength. 
Um, some of the sensors, if you look in the white pages in Bosch, they're in that 70, 60 to 70 megahertz range that they're signaling out at. So it's a much tighter, much more defined. Doppler, a lot of the time when you're watching the nightly news and they're telling you the storm's coming, that's a Doppler radar, not a millimeter wave. Millimeter waves just not made for the expanse of doing like weather, Doppler is. Now the signals, you will hear the terms frequency modulated to where if they wanna have a wide sweep versus a very tight sweep. And this is where our long range radar, our medium range radar, our short range radar, all of those things start to come into play as to what the application is. So the one that's mounted on the side corner for cross traffic or blind spot is different than the one that is in the front of the car for active cruise control. And I believe there are a couple of systems that is a dual sensor to where it's capable of a short and a medium or a medium and a long, um, just as they refine technologies. But early on, you might have three or four different sensors on the vehicle depending on its location. Diagnostics. First things first, look for damage. So the bumper cover is knocked off a little bit. If that sensor is mounted to the cover, it's not seen correctly. What if it's had a repaint? If they put more paint on that bumper cover, that thickness of the plastic in the paint is now more, and essentially you've like put muffles or glasses onto that sensor. It can't see as well because it has more to penetrate. A lot of cars now, people take and they get that clear wrap for paint protection. Well, one's good, two's better, and three will be wonderful. Well, they just made it a lot thicker. So whether it was a collision damage, a modification, um, all those starts to come into play. If the body structure was tweaked, so a lot of the time these sensors will be hard mounted to the body structures. Well, if the car got bent a little bit, if they can't get that near perfect again, it doesn't matter what that sensor is looking at, it's always going to be a degree off or two degrees off. And you'll, you know, as you dig around through information, they'll talk about, you know, a degree or two here is like 10 to 12 feet, you know, 60 yards away. You're looking in the wrong lane now. You're either looking at oncoming traffic or traffic in the lane next to you and not seeing the car in front of you. So all of these things come into play. So we've got to look at bumpers. We've got to look at the grill because a lot of the time the active cruise control is using a, a sensor that's sometimes Toyota was using them right in the Toyota emblem in the front grill. Uh, others would have them down lower in the grill for active cruise control. Early ones were big fish eyes. Uh, a lot of the new ones are just flat boxes now. You don't even see them because they're under body panels or behind the bumpers and things like that. Same things that come into play when it comes to fault codes, when it comes into our electrical testing, our weather conditions. So this is where, as we start to teach these to our classes, I don't need to cover this. I need the students to tell me, okay, what would we do for diagnostics? Maybe even before I bring the screen up, okay, now it's time to diagnose. What do we need to look at? So that we start building that repetition and you know, programming that answer into them. Calibration, I've got to calibrate them. Now here's the hard part. They're probably not adjustable or minimally adjustable. And in many cases, like if we're talking a camera, it has no adjustability. You do have some of the early, uh, some of the later radar sensors that do have a small amount of adjustability, whether it's on the physical mount. Um, there's a couple of them out there that are actually auto adjusting. They have a built-in little stepper motor capability to make some correction as they're going through calibration. And again, you're, you're in the same scenarios again, whether it's a purely mechanical calibration, a dynamic calibration, a combination of both, and newer systems, again, moving towards the mechanical because of the difficulties with dynamic calibrations. All right, so let's hit the next round of questions up in here. Let's see. One I was at. Um, uh, Ed had mentioned, if I remember correctly, the original active cruise control radar signal did not register on non-moving objects, such as an overpass or abatement. And yeah, that would be in the, uh, the algorithm side of it. So as we saw with the radar example, the video, it sees those objects 
But it, because that object is not moving, it is static, the algorithm is basically saying, that's a wall. I, need to, I don't need to pay that close attention to it. Where's the moving things? So it's still seeing it. It just doesn't necessarily act upon it. Uh, Ruben mentions, are LiDAR systems in production vehicles are just prototype, very expensive. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about LiDAR here pretty soon. And when it comes to it, I haven't heard of anybody that's got it out production yet. Um, I remember reading something that Volvo uh, was probably going to be the first one to have active LiDAR on a production car, but I don't think it's a, out until 21 or 22. Um, they are expensive. The prices are coming down. Uh, the biggest challenge is, is a little bit of the ugly factor with LiDAR, and we'll talk more about that here in a minute. Uh, radar question. Does anyone know the limitations for automotive radar, frequency, power, and range? Thinking in the term of radiation safety, I've checked the SAE site and was unsuccessful finding the answer. This is something I'd like to include when teaching the students about radar. And that was from Andrew. Andrew, tell them not to stand in front of the front bumper if they want to reproduce. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> now, I, I haven't seen anything either. Uh, but, you know, the, your wristwatch, your cell phone, everything with electricity has you know, some radiation signature to it. Um, I haven't seen, you know, and I've been dealing with the radar on vehicles since 03 or so, 2003, 2004. And I don't think I've ever seen anything about radiation safety or anything like that. They never tell you to stay away or, or keep a lead blanket on. Um, so I, I haven't seen if anybody else has, maybe they could uh, chime in in the chat with it. And it could be one of those things they just don't want to really, they don't really want to tell you as population control. I, I don't know. <laughs> but that's a great question, though. No. Uh, David asks, what kind of complaints might a customer have? My active cruise control doesn't work. My rear cross traffic doesn't work. My blind spot detection doesn't work. Um, those would all be complaints that a customer might have. And usually if the system's disabled because of a sensor issue, um, I'm going to have dash warnings. I'm going to have a warning light or I'm going to have a, a message in the display or something like that. I'll have fault codes, all those wonderful things because the systems are, are very sensitive in that if there's an issue, it's not going to work. It, it's not like we saw with airbags where they say, well, the airbag lights on, um, the airbags won't go off. And then you get in an accident and the airbags went off. It may, it may not. All it's telling you is it's got a problem. The, the radar sensors themselves, I've heard both extremes. Um, I've heard people that said that the car had been, I think it was last week somebody had mentioned, uh, or I saw it in, a, in an article I was reading, they had rented a car, the car had been in an accident of some sort, the sensor had been damaged or misaligned, they had reused the vehicle, it didn't work. Um, they took it back, you know, they have, it was a bunch of instructors, I think it was last week they mentioned it. instructors looked at it and found out that it was out of whack um, and come to find out the previous renter had wrecked it and had it fixed, but it didn't have any fault codes or lights on evidently. So I think it depends on the system, what kind of feedback you're going to get. The customer complaints most likely to be, it doesn't work. Something doesn't work. Uh, John Taylor, hold on, Mark. Uh, John Taylor, infrared any infrared technology for fog and ice. Uh, you do see, uh, basically, it's the night vision that you're seeing. And in the early ones, they had, you had some uh, infrared. The later ones are, are uh, uh, geez, can't remember the right number for it. It's not the, it's more of a thermal imaging. And it is a green scale, not the, uh, the gray scales. And they're extremely sensitive. Uh, they're just more costly. And I think my personal belief is, is down the road as we start to need to cover the gaps to, to get really full autonomous, I think you're going to have a night vision come into play. And night vision has less of an issue when it comes to fog and ice and things like that, because it's looking at thermal signatures. And if there's any heat there and it's snowing, it's going to see it. Now, is that going to keep you from crashing into a rock? Unless that rock was holding heat, you're not going to see the rock. Um, Josh just did a calibration on the 2018 Camry for the front millimeter wave radar. If 
during the calibration, it says not to stand in directly in front of the radar within the first few feet for safety during calibration, during driving, not sure if that changes. Uh, I'd be willing to bet that, you know, because when you were doing the calibration, and I hope that worked out okay, uh, when you were doing the calibration, it was activating that sensor. So don't think of these radar sensors being on 24-7, 365. They're probably only on when the vehicle's driving, when it's moving, whether it's driving forward for different things or if it's got rear cross traffic and I put it in reverse. I don't think that they're on constantly until the vehicle's in motion. So if you're running in front of the car um, in close distance, yeah, you're going to get nuked a little bit. But in, the, in, your, in your bay at work, um, probably not. And I would like to think that the cars are smart enough that even if you had it on the rack in drive and moving, you know, the tires moving, the vehicle knows it's not moving and, and maybe they'll activate, maybe they won't. Um, I think that's going to be a big one where every manufacturer's repair instructions are going to come into play as to any safety precautions on uh, what, what feedback you might get from them. Uh, I got one more here and then I'll come to you, Mark. Uh, radar, camera, LIDAR, NAVI work together to verify action and provide redundancy. Uh, yes, we're seeing that with the hybrid systems a little bit, you know, when it comes to the NAVI. Um, I expect as we see more and more autonomous, yeah, NAVI is going to play a bigger part of it. And, and you know, from people I've spoken with, it'll be satellite based, not GPS based. And the vehicle to vehicle communications are going to come in more and more. And, you know, we like to talk about these things as, okay, radar is doing these systems and cameras are doing those systems. Well, the reality is the cameras are still looking. The radar is still looking. The LIDAR, if it's on there, is still looking. The, the night vision, if it was activated, it's still looking. It's just a matter of the algorithm in whatever modules in charge deciding who it's going to look at what information it's going to take in and what it's going to act on. And, and we'll talk briefly on that at the end of this and it's called sensor fusion. Uh, Mark, you had something. Oh, um, you know, I, uh, some of the systems I worked on, like the, the act, uh, uh, adaptive cruise control with the radar in the front. Um, I just noticed that they're very smart. Like if, like if the radar was off its mouse just a little bit, cause it had like a ball socket and if the ball socket popped off, and it was not facing the right direction, the system was pretty smart in recognizing that and it would then give you a warning on the instrument cluster and, and, not, and then you couldn't use that. I'm sure you're, you've mentioned that before, I think. Yeah, and you know, they, a lot of the time that active cruise control sensor, that front radar on the early systems was way down low in the front uh, spoiler area, right at perfect parking curb height mm. on a little metal bracket. So when you were feeling for the end of the parking space, you found it with your active cruise control sensor. <laughs> and yeah, because that sensor, and the reason it can recognize that it's not seen correctly is because it's not expecting to get a return that might be two feet away or three feet away. It's not expecting to see a return that calculates that soon. So the logic probably comes into play and says, wait a minute, I shouldn't see anything that close. I must have something wrong. And, you know, as these systems, again, continue to mature, they become smarter. And they're going to make that, that calculation, that determination going, no, I can't really see that there. And we've seen that with engine management electronics for some time. You know, it's a five volt system and it sees 12 volts and it goes, no, 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 no. It can't be that. It, it, it just doesn't make sense. It's not rational. So it sets a fault. Another quick thing popped in my head, Kurt, is that, look, if you look like a, um, look at a model, model car, like a Honda, right? It's kind of an economy car, yet they've seemed to have put as many of these systems in it as they can, because they're really into safety. So they've stacked it with systems. But if I were to get a similar loaded Audi, I don't know about BMW, but if you build an Audi like that, the costs go up significantly. Is there that big of a difference between the products used on the Honda and the products used on the Audi? I don't think it's as big as people think. Um, a lot of those parts are made by the same people, you know, so those mm. same tier one vendors, let's say it's Bosch, they're selling it to everybody. Nip and Dinso selling it to everybody. Delphi, they're selling it to everybody, uh, Mobius, et cetera. So those tier ones, it's an off the shelf part. And 
it's the backside, it's the software, it's the determinations. That's where the difference is. And I think what you see, because I've driven a Toyota that had active cruise and I've driven BMWs with active cruise. The Toyota is not as sensitive. It's a little more clunky in the sense of accelerates a little harder, decelerates a little harder. You know, it's not as refined. I guess we could use that term. It's not as refined. And that's, you know, I guess that's about the only justification I can have with the cost differences. Uh, Toyota 2019, they, they've got Toyota sense on everything. Um, I think what a lot drives this is customers expectation of safety and some of the new safety test parameters. So when they go and do those crash tests and it comes back with three or four stars because they don't have some of these things, that's actually a negative sales point. Even though they're not mandated, it just didn't test as high as something else. And people are different now. They don't buy cars because they're a Chevy guy. Like, you know, when we grew up, hey, you bought Chevys because you were a Chevy family. People buy cars like appliances now. What's the fuel mileage? What are the features? What's the color? I'll take that one not so much by the brand. So those things, you know, consumer reports type results come into play. And that's, you know, gonna continue, even though we're gonna see these things be mandated. And it's the same thing we saw with airbags in the mid eighties. When airbags first came out, they were on the high end European cars. And then about three years later, they were on everything because that became the new expectation. And that was even before the government mandated them. So I think we're in that same period right now with ADAS, but yet we're going to see mandated a couple of systems. I think it's 2021 or 2022. Uh, we're going to see, you know, things like emergency braking and some, you know, they're saying one or two systems um, that are going to be required. And it's, it'll be a DOT thing. Let's get in back in a few more of these and get moving on to the next section. Uh, radar too high, lock on American airline flight, shoots over the top. Yeah, if it's out of whack, it's out of whack, and who knows what you're going to pick up. Um, if it's shooting at the ground, it's probably going to turn off, but if it's shooting in the air, it'll never see the car before you hit. Um, Josh, true, I believe this is, uh, was just for active cruise control, so probably not enabled until. Good. Uh, Mark, remember the volume of out of work liability attorneys. Yes. Um, yeah. ADAS, that is probably the second biggest discussion with ADAS. The first is people just don't know much about it. The second is liability. Um, it's a big deal, you know? So if you're doing alignments and the car's got ADAS and you didn't do calibration, you just opened a window. And that's another thing that should be really uh, conveyed to our students and you know, one other way that you can use these materials is you can take it to your industry. You could do some industry training with these same materials because the majority of the guys out there, they don't know this stuff either. And giving them that awareness. Uh, I saw it in a hunter's class that, you know, the majority of the guys in the shops weren't doing it because the, the, they were worried about the cost. And well, what's the cost of the liability if you don't do it? Uh, Jesse, could buying could be buying power number of Hondas on the road versus Audi? Yeah, I think volume of sales comes into play when it comes to costs on on technical systems. Uh, I think a lot of it's also it's it's that five star crash thing. And if I have it, I can pass that level, and I'm going to sell more cars. And if I don't have it, I'm going to get a three, and I can't sell as many cars. And I think really it comes down to how many cars can I sell? Um, the costs they're going to pass through anyways. Okay. Hey, so. hey, hey, Kurt. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Kurt, if I if I could please, um, I think one of the points you made at the beginning of this conference is um, there may be differences between one manufacturer and another in terms of how well it does a particular action or what how it uses its technology. So so that could make a difference in cost too. Um, yes. For instance, some cars compensate for on for curves. You know, when a radar looks out it's got to know whether is that a bounce off of a vehicle that's on a curve or is that a vehicle coming straight at me? So, so th there's a lot of, there's a lot of software um, uh, adjustments that different manufacturers make. So it's important for technicians to, to drive a variety of vehicles because there will be subtle differences between one vehicle and another. Yeah. That's a great point to make, Mike is it is a, it's an evolving field. And 
with all those little things. And, and like I had mentioned, it was the smoothness or the refinement between them. And the systems are extremely smart. I mean, radar is not new. I mean, they were developing radar, you know, in the middle of World War II. So this stuff's out there. And as these manufacturers refine it and you get some of the newer uh, companies like a Tesla who start to push that envelope as to how we can use it at a higher level. I mean, Tesla is a good example when it comes to LiDAR. They don't believe in it. They feel that the cameras, the radar, and millimeter accurate maps overcome the, the, the little bit, in their mind, the little benefit of LiDAR. Other manufacturers are saying, no, we're going to have all that and we're going to have LiDAR because it gives us that one other gap that fills in. Uh, right now, there's no one way and SAE and the federal government haven't come out and said you have to do it this way. So it's the Wild West a little bit. All right, so let's talk about LiDAR. Now, LiDAR, it's, it's very interesting in how it can provide a level of detail way beyond a radar. So a radar can give us, you know, some levels of a three-dimensional picture, but it is, it's just that. It's based on a bounce back. It's like that video I showed. It's a bunch of dots. LiDAR is literally going to draw a picture. It literally has the capability to draw that three-dimensional picture. And so that creates a whole better awareness of its surrounding. When we're trying to replicate that human eye, the more things that we can do to give that level of depth and more become a bigger issue. Uh, so LiDAR has a lot of good benefits to that. Uh, LiDAR was created for the DARPA prize. Now DARPA is the military technology competition that they have and they've done it for many years for different things. And a few years back, they had one for autonomous vehicles to be able to go from a point A to a point B, and then it was a, a desert run, and then it was in an in-town environment and all that stuff. And this guy wanted to go win DARPA, and he came out with this sensor, and nobody else had it. And he absolutely dominated DARPA that year. Well, the sensor was LiDAR, and the guy was basically the creator of Velodyne. Uh, which is one of the largest LiDAR makers out there. So this becomes a point where, hey, has the students seen anything about LiDAR? If they live in the Bay Area, they've probably seen a Google car at some point in time, or even a truck, or, you know, who knows whoever's car that's got a big egg on the roof spinning around. If they've seen that, they've seen LiDAR. A lot of the video games, you know, some of the, the, the screens, replicate a LiDAR-like image. So let's take a look at some LiDAR stuff. This is LiDAR 101, created by Velodyne to better educate the public about LiDAR technology and how it can advance roadway safety, prevent car crashes, and save lives. The first thing you should know about LiDAR is that the sensors utilize the same iSafe laser used in everyday life at grocery stores, for light shows, and for home security systems in keeping us safe. This sort of technology has been in use for years. In order to break down how the sensor works, we will highlight a single photon or particle of light. As you can see here, the single light photon is emitted from the sensor, hits an object like a tree, and bounces back to the LiDAR sensor, at which point the data from the light photon's travels is recorded. It is measuring distance and time. The amazing thing about this is that it works for non-stationary objects in real time, such as pedestrians, bicyclists, and other cars. Because LiDAR is its own light source, it can even see at night. This is an advantage over cameras, which have trouble in darkness. A good LiDAR has from 8 to 128 laser beams to measure the environment. The laser beams in the LiDAR emit billions of light photons per second at 360 degrees in order to completely see the surrounding world. It is pretty amazing that billions of data points and calculations are happening in real time 
This allows the car to see and keep drivers, occupants, and all other road users safe. It is kind of like spraying paint all over the surrounding environment in order to highlight objects, make them recognizable, and show movement. Conversely, here you have a two-dimensional picture of the street via camera sensor. Cameras are basically a flat representation of the environment. Where a 2D vision system falls short, LiDAR is able to show a real-time 3D view of its surrounding environment. After all, our world is three-dimensional, not flat. Other issues that affect cameras' ability to see include optical illusions and lack of measurement. Also, cameras require more computer power and run hotter than a LiDAR sensor. None of these affect LiDAR. With rotating LiDAR, vehicles have a 360-degree, three-dimensional view of the world in real time that goes far beyond the scope of the camera and even beyond the human eye. Here is another example of how the LiDAR sensor can see in comparison to a suite of sensors, including camera and radar. The car on the left, equipped with a suite of sensors, still has blind spots. With the LiDAR on the right, issues such as blind spots or wide-angle hazards are non-existent. It can see 360 degrees at a range of up to 300 meters. LiDAR is able to accurately identify objects at up to 300 meters distance. Even high-resolution radar cannot render objects accurately. And, as you can see, objects look like blobs with radar. We know that LiDAR is essential technology in all levels of automation, particularly in vehicles traveling over 15 miles per hour. It is critical that the vehicle is able to recognize a paper bag blowing across the roadway versus a small child in order to make accurate split-second decisions. For advanced safety and autonomy, we feel that LiDAR is an essential technology. There are safety systems now in cars that address fender benders, and it is a 360-degree LiDAR technology that can significantly prevent casualties. So, LiDAR is a whole different ballgame. Um, the spatial awareness associated with LiDAR is much, much higher. Um, your costs are still higher at the moment. And there are some physical conditions for, for LiDAR that are really important to address. So what's LiDAR? Well, it's a device that sends out a laser pulse, performs calculations of location based on its return. It can determine speed, direction, altitude, and with those calculations all taking place nearly in real time and three-dimensional. Uh, if you Google search, and I think I've got it embedded in some of the materials that are up on the ATL site, there's actually a Ford video where they uh, take a Ford Taurus with LiDAR out onto a desert track at night, and they put the camera on night vision, and you can see the depth changes in the road, you know, the you know, a pothole or a high spot and a low spot. So it creates that three-dimensional grid, quite literally. And they could see that from the laser projection when they had a night vision camera on it. Human eye, you're never going to see it. But it, it, it's pretty amazing what it's doing. It is literally driving around, put, laying down this <laughs> grid all the way around the vehicle to make those calculations and measurements. So why? It's to bring more information in. It's that spatial awareness. We're improving the sensor array for the vehicle to know more information about where it is and what's around it. The benefits are like everything else. Less accidents, less injuries, better pathways to autonomy, better traffic flows. And we can utilize this in whatever system we want to, whether it's a lane departure, not maybe so good based on it's not going to see the lines per se, but a uh, blind spot detection, active cruise supplementations, or mid-range vehicle supplementations. Now, LiDAR types, it's going to, again, produce, you know, as many as 150,000 pulses per second as it rotates in 360 degrees. And that 360 degrees becomes an important thing to think of when it comes to the, the design of the system and the mounting of this system. So, LiDAR, he does have these materials in the Bosch, just like he does on the cameras and he does on the radar. So, all that stuff is also in those Bosch uh, presentations uh, up on the ATL site. Uh, they're still somewhat high costs, 
and they typically require a high mounting point. So for me to really see 360 degrees around the vehicle, I need this sensor mounted on the roof of the car. And it's not gonna look real good on your 911. And that challenge is what's one of the holdbacks for LiDAR, because if I can't mount it up high to where it sees everything, I have to mount more of them. And if I can't mount them up high on the roof line where they look ugly, I have to mount them lower on the body, which means I need to add even more to have the same kind of coverages. So location and costs become a big concern with LiDAR. So we're gonna, we're gonna measure our range, our angle, our height. We're gonna measure all of our axes. So roll and pitch will also be picked up. And remember, we're shooting a laser beam. So basically speed of light, right? Well, speed of light's a, what is it, 1,860,000 miles per second or some crazy number like that. So this thing is going to get a lot of response very, very quickly. But because we're getting so much data point back, the processing power has to go way up. So that becomes another part of the costs associated with LiDAR. It's not just the sensor, but you're now talking uh, uh, the ECU, the cooling of that ECU, just the flat capacity for that ECU to flow that much data that fast to be practically real time. Now the processor with those include, it's gonna have your XYZ locations, you know, for physical positioning and stuff like that, but it's also measuring those inertia points as well. And you've seen these here in the Bay Area, we see these things running around with a little thing spinning around on the roof, that's the LiDAR. What you're starting to see for the production is like the picture in the lower right, where they're trying to find a way to get that sensor off the roof and a little less obtrusive, but they're still pretty obtrusive. They're hanging out of things. Uh, some of the manufacturers, they put like a roof rack on the car and they build it into the corners of the roof rack. Uh, Byton, which is a Chinese made car that's uh, got a, a, a California location in San Jose, they've actually got it to where when the car is in autonomous mode, these sensors, they come out of doors in the fenders. It's almost like a gas door. It pops out, sticks out of the car a little bit. And now you got your LiDAR when you're in autonomous mode. When you're not in autonomous mode, it retracts back into the fender and it closes the door. So it's not ugly all the time. It's only ugly when you're driving with it in the autonomous modes. Uh, a lot of the newer ones have gotten down to like a thick hockey puck in size. So they don't have to be that giant egg beater. Uh, that sensor on the top, not, you know, five years ago would have been in the tens of thousands. Uh, the hockey puck now is, you know, a couple thousand. So those technologies have massively dropped in costs. So again, if you've got a particular system you're talking about, use those, okay? Uh, we're using mobile LiDAR, obviously it's on a car, it's driving around, but they do have libel, uh, LiDAR that are static. And, you know, it's not really the application for the automotive side. Well, back to diagnosis. What's the first thing we need to look at? Signs of damage. So if this Volvo's having a bad day, his LiDAR sensors askew a little bit. Uh, but regardless of where they put it, it's just like all the other sensors and cameras we've talked about. We've got to follow those same steps. Does it have power? Does it have ground? Does it have fault codes? Does it have a bus signal? Is it damaged? Is it obstructed? You know, have they put something on it, over it, in front of it, around it? All of those things come into play. Now with LiDAR, while it's better than some of the sensors in certain conditions, it can still be affected. So if you're in the Midwest and you got that big, thick, flaky snow coming down, that, la that laser send signal could bounce off of that or hail or sleet. Heavy smoke where there's a lot of particulate matter in the air could reflect that. Heavy dust clouds could reflect it. So anything that affects uh, a radar signal bouncing off could have some effect also on a LIDAR signal. So again, right now there is no perfect one thing. It's, it's the layover of multiple things that are probably gonna be the answer. And oh yeah, you need to calibrate them. So this is a, a calibration room for LIDAR. Oof. So there's a couple of targets there and this is only one shot of the room. Those targets are completely 360 degrees around the car and the car is on a turn plate. 
So for them to calibrate this, it's going to sit in there and it's going to spin around and it's going to see all these targets all the time. And then they're going to take that calibration plate and they're going to rotate it around so that they can confirm that throughout its rotation, regardless of where the vehicle is, that it can see what it needs to see and go through what it needs to go through. Um, I'm going to bet this is going to be bigger than the 30 by 16 uh, space recommendations for ADAS calibration. The reality is you're not going to do this in a shop. Um, this is still at that um, concept levels. You know, these are still the Google cars, the Lyft cars, things like that that are running this around. Uh, it, it's not GM Ford Chrysler uh, yet in the production, but GM has had Cruise, which mm -hmm. is in San Francisco, the little uh, uh, Chevy Bolts mm -hmm. that are running around with these systems. But it's not going to come in your dealership anytime soon. And it's definitely not coming to Billy Bob's uh, auto uh, anytime soon either. So all these sensors, all these arrays, all this stuff comes into play. So any questions on that? And then we're going to run a little bit later than the 2.30 just because we have a lot of stuff to talk about today. Um, so let's take a look up here real quick. The buying power one we had. Um, Ruben, the only thing that really change, constantly changes in the summary is the what. Uh, so the rest should become repetitive to the student. Hmm, location cost sounds like bad uh, <laughs> real estate. Yeah, you know, a lot of this is repetitive, but that's how our students are going to learn. And once I've covered it a couple of times with the students, hey, the next system, okay, what are going to be those steps? What kind of things might they be using this for? And now they're teaching. Uh, the sooner that we can get away from being an instructor centered where we're telling them and they can start to tell us based on what they've learned and know, that speeds up everything. Uh, Peter Ha, any experience with lighter technology in paint, automotive or industrial paint? I'm not sure what he means with in paint. Um, possibly on the return, you know, if it hit a car and it bounced back. But I don't, you know, the paint itself, I mean, if we're thinking like stealth technology on an airplane, a lot of those kind of things were absorption surfaces where they absorbed that signal and it didn't allow it to return or they had such extreme angles that it bounced it off and it didn't return, it reflected away. So I'm not sure what Peter's uh, question is there. Maybe he can uh, fill that in and we'll come back to it. So let's get into ultrasonic. This will be pretty quick. Ultrasonic sensors, not new. We've had park distance control for a very long time, for a very long time. Um, we'll bring Mazda's little video clip up real quick. The Mazda Genuine Reverse Park Assist System is equipped with four sensors that admit an ultrasonic signal. The sensors alert the driver to approaching objects by producing a sequence of warning tones from a buzzer situated within the vehicle. The system is activated once the vehicle is put into reverse and a functioning system is indicated by two beeps from the system buzzer. The first buzzer tone heard will be a slow beeping indicating the vehicle is between 1.8 and 1.5 meters from the object. The beeping will steadily increase in speed as the vehicle enters each new detection zone. 1.5 to 1.2 meters from the object, 1.2 to 0.9 of a meter, 0.9 to 0.6 of a meter, 0.6 to 0.3 of a meter. If the vehicle enters the final detection zone within 0.3 of a meter of the obstacle, the buzzer will produce a continuous tone. It is recommended that the driver stop immediately if this tone is entered. System triangulation means sensors can communicate with each other, allowing small and odd-shaped objects to be detected. Dynamic sensing memory means that objects fixed to the vehicle, such as a tow bar, are not picked up by the sensors, reducing false triggering. If fitted with a master genuine trailer harness, the system will be automatically disabled when the trailer is connected to the vehicle. Reverse parking sensors are covered by master warranty. So I let that play out just so that if you haven't had a vehicle with that, you've got a little bit of awareness and we're going to talk about uh, park assist and things like that in another session. Uh, Vance had chimed in on response to Peter with LiDAR. Paint thickness from the body shop, if the paint's too thick, it would not work as designed. The big thing with LiDAR, it's not going to be behind a bumper. Um, so paint thickness isn't going to affect it. It's going to need a clear view. So if it's not on the rooftop, it's going to be out from a fender, or even if it's not giving a 360 degree view, 
it's going to have a clear window. So they're not going to shoot from behind paint at this point in time with the, the technologies. It's going to be a lens that you physically could see. So I don't think paint thickness is going to come in for that. Uh, okay, so ultrasonic. It's going to send out a sound wave. So we've talked about electrical waves. We've talked about uh, laser bolts. Now we're talking about a physical sound wave that's going to go out, hit an object, and return. Very similar to what LiDAR is doing and what radar is doing. It's just a different mean of uh, that bounce. And it's going to have those same benefits, those same utilizations. So the sensor itself, in most cases, the sensor is both the transmitter and the receiver. So it's going to generate that ultrasonic wave. It's going to go out. Hopefully it hits an object. It's going to come back and that same sensor is going to receive it. It works on a specific cycle. The reason is I wouldn't be able to receive it if I'm always transmitting. So they typically will do both, not one or the other. They will do both. They're also pulsed in a sequence. And that sequence is really important because on newer cars, you can tell is the obstruction on the left, the right, the middle, because the sequence of the firing of those sensors. So they're going to go boom, 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 boom. And depending on when it bounces back and where it bounces back, the system can then calculate it's the left side, it's the right side, it's the middle. Okay. Now the sensor types, they're typically mounted in the bumper covers. You can have them in the front and in the rear. A lot, of, a lot of car manufacturers will put them in the front of the vehicle for when you're parking uh, into close places. You'll also see them on a lot of newer cars on the fender lip opening on the front wheels right behind the wheel on the flat part of the fender opening and sometimes in the front of the wheel. And what that's for is for the parking assist for the, the systems that help parallel park the cars. They're using the ultrasonic sensors to measure the parking space side. And we'll talk about that in another, in another uh, session. So they can be in the front, the rear or side. They can be different colors. So this is an important thing. You don't want to paint an ultrasonic sensor. That's like putting earmuffs on it. If you paint over them, the, they don't generate that signal correctly anymore and they don't receive the signal in anymore. You've insulated them. So most of the manufacturers do have them in a body color paint, uh, but if they've been damaged in any way, shape or form, they're not serviceable. You're going to replace them. So that becomes the big piece of the diagnostics. It's that visual inspection. Is that sensor physically scratched? Is it damaged? Has it have paint coating on it? Does it have road grime on it? Uh, the picture in the left, is the sensor been pushed back into the bumper a little bit? Because typically they're just clipped into the bumper covers. So did it get pushed in uh, by an impact? Um, all of those things come into play. Clear coats, did they put a big obtrusive uh, license plate frame on it? Because in some cases, the license plate frame, if it sticks out, can actually clip where the cones come out of the sensors or trailer hitch things in the back like we saw in the video. Calibration, you typically don't have to do anything to calibrate these. You confirm that they're mounted correctly into the bumper cover. The most important thing, though, is the connectors. You've got to get the connectors on the right sensor because, like I said, these operate in a firing sequence. If you switch the connectors, it's like switching a spark plug wire. The wrong thing happens at the wrong time. Well, if you switch the wires and it's getting feedback thinking that it's on the right rear and it's really on the left rear, you crashed. So that's the biggest thing with the ultrasonic sensors is paying attention to mounting and the connections. So we've talked about a lot of different sensors, whether it's cameras, LIDAR, radar, ultrasonic, and whatever may come in the future. And all of this is really kind of rolled up into a, into a one single term called sensor fusion. And the whole idea of sensor fusion is, is taking in all of this information and utilizing it to have a better all around picture of what's the surroundings of the vehicle. So even though the manufacturer may tell us in the information, oh, it's primarily, you know, it's using this camera for this. 
That doesn't mean the system's not also seeing it from a radar sensor or a LIDAR sensor. It might be the primary input that it's making a decision on, but hey, it's still getting this other information. And as these systems evolve and they have higher levels of intellect or AI, they're using that fusion of sensor information much, much more. We're talking just crazy amounts of data. So let's take a jump to an autonomous vehicle. They're estimating that on a typical autonomous vehicle, it's going to generate and use about 40 terabytes of data every eight hours of driving. 40 terabytes for eight hours of driving. That's an immense amount of data. And it's going to do it tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And it's going to activate in near real time on making its decisions. Otherwise, you know, it's going to crash. So a lot of stuff today. Um, let's see what we got in the questions. So let me back up here a little bit. Hey, Chris, that last point you just made, is a lot of energy required for that? Yes. And that's why you're seeing a lot of these on EVs and hybrids because there is an energy draw, even though that's one of the biggest areas they're trying to address is controlling that energy draw, controlling the heat generated from the processors, things like that. The hardware side of it, believe it or not, is off the shelf stuff. A, a lot of us have had the chance to, to go to some of these companies and yeah, they buy in these parts off the shelf. The big investment is really in the software. It's the AI generation, not so much the hardware. Uh, but yeah, there's electrical evolved and space. You know, when you see these cars, there's the trunk is full of stuff. It's not full of luggage. Okay, so let's get back here. Um, paint thickness. Yes, we talked about John Taylor. Systems work great and easier than a backup camera, including a rolling cart or a kid running behind. Yeah, a lot of the ultrasonic sensors seem to be a little easier to use than cameras. Um, the one downside to them is if you get into a car that has a backup camera that has the targeting to where when you turn the wheel, it's moving these target grids and you just line them up into the parking space and you look like a great person that parks. Um, but there's goods and bads to both. And a lot of the cars that have cameras, you'll still see them with the ultrasonic. So it's a little bit of both on them. Uh, let's see here, Robin, you're talking about mill thickness measurements. Each coat adds addition of mill thickness to the total coats of paint. Agreed. And it's not just the paint, it's now the clear as well, or any body filler that was in play. So, you know, body shops are, they don't paint like the manufacturers do. The manufacturers, it's just a super thin layer. Body shops, a lot of the time, you know, it's paint it deep, sand it down and make it look good. So that thickness could be substantially more than it would have been from the factory. And then by the time they put clears on it or any filler that was under it, uh, because of a big thing. Uh, Mark, common problem, did the body shop remember to secure the connector? Yeah, body shops historically, it's been make it look good, send it down the road. Um, and all these little things like lights not working or ultrasonic sensors, you know, they, it was an easy out for them. Hey, the car was crashed. I didn't know it worked before. Uh, it's going to be a whole different ball game for them with ADAS. And they're going to need to have a greater involvement in it, not just send it off to the shops. Uh, Mark, how important is ride height with ultrasonic? Remember, all of these sensors basically are producing a cone. So as that goes out, it's an ever growing cone. If I change that angle or I change the height, I've changed where that cone is going and that cone could now see more or less of any given area. So any height change, any angle change on any of these, whether it's a camera, a radar, a LIDAR, an ultrasonic, affects the outcome. And that, that impact becomes greater the farther the distance away because that cone is way bigger as you get farther away. Um, let's see here. Sherman, I believe it was mentioned that 300 meters was the distance. Um, I think that was on the LIDAR. Um, LIDAR will get out there. Night vision gets way out there as well. Uh, Rick had to go. Let's see here. Robin had mentioned $400 for a mill thickness gauge to measure coats of paint. Yeah, it's like an ohm meter kind of thing. I've never used one. I've seen them. And that's probably going to be a tool 
that you know shops that are doing ADAS work are probably going to have to invest in, along with teaching their technicians, uh, or in, in our case, teaching our students how to recognize the signs of collision repair, paint repair, things like that, because those thickness variations over a radar sensor are going to be huge. Any hey, Kurt. Questions up in there? Yeah, Kurt, go ahead. Um, Blair Norton College, Alameda. I'm just wondering, what is the uh, for the ultrasonic, what is the range? That's really for short range. Yeah, they're really short, short range. Um, the, the number, I think I've seen, uh, God, well, the number I saw was like 12 or 15 feet. Okay. Um, it's All really right. meant for that six six feet to one foot range. Okay, um, yeah, that's what I understand. It is. Yeah, it, it's not something that, you know, you're not, it's not a rear collision avoidance kind of thing from uh, a, a distance. It's you're backing into a parking space or backing Absolutely. out of your driveway. So you don't or run like over the kids and the tricycles. Pedestrian, yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And, you know, even the pedestrian, uh, you know, the angle of it, yeah, if they're far enough off, it's going to catch them. But if they're really close to the back bumper, it may not see them because the cone isn't out big enough yet. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So the seminar stuff, and you guys can still post stuff in. I just want to get this slide up in there. Uh, we had to combine some things in to fit us in a nine week. So a lot of these sessions are going to be much closer to the hour and a half and maybe a little bit more. So, you know, kind of figure that into your calendar. But at the same time, we'll save a little bit of time because like Ruben had mentioned, there's a fair amount of repetition in these. And as I go through them in the future, kind of like I started to on the end ones of this, probably not going to go as deep in some of those things, but use that as a chance to, okay, how, what would I ask my students in this case? Um, they've heard it a couple of times. What would they bring to the table now? Or what other ideas could they bring to the table? Um, they're not necessarily grouped in any particular purposeful meaning. So it's not that they're all camera or they're all radar. They're just kind of thrown together to, to give variety. But I did want to keep the last two separate. I wanted to keep connected vehicles and vehicle programming separate because those are two really important topics. Programming has been an important topic for a long time and it'll give us a chance to get into some uh, goods and bads and setups and stuff. But connected vehicles is, you know, right behind ADAS and going to be the next thing that's going to hit and it's going to hit really hard, uh, especially as 5G comes out. Um, and the, the combination of ADAS and connected vehicles and satellite navigation is going to change everything for autonomous vehicles. So if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to put them in there. And, and if you don't, thanks for coming. Uh, we'll see you uh, next week, same time, same station. Thank you, everybody. I'll have the uh, recording uploaded and Kurt's PowerPoint slides uploaded to the ATL website when I send <laughs> next week's invitation along with the new schedule. But if you have any suggestions or other questions, please uh, email them to me. And thanks so much for participating in today's training session. We look forward to seeing you next week. And a special thank you to Kurt. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks. Hey, Kurt, you got another uh, second? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Can you see this? <laughs> this is my no, tablet. It, it disappears I... into your background. Oh, it does not. Okay, so this is my, um, let me even stop that. This is the tablet I got from uh, when I was working with uh, Audi. And what's cool is um, it is that it, it reloads latest technology. So, you know, I left the brand in 2016. I got this 2019 data and this is on an A8. But anyhow, it's pretty up to date. And it's talking about the um, predictive efficiency assist and it is using navigation along with the adaptive cruise control to figure out the best efficiency and, and also uh, traffic sign um, recognition too. Yeah. And again, so they tied it in for the efficiency side, similar to what they were doing with the hybrids and EVs and stuff. It's how do I make the car more efficient? Let's utilize the nav information with that as well. It's predictive stuff that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and I so think... And as, and as the nav gets more refined, because you know, GPS is getting a little clunky, but as it goes to satellite navigation, it's going to be even more accurate. Yeah, and, and, uh, it, and then I think there's just one main module that everything's kind of communicating with here, and that's the, uh, the gateway, I guess. 
So that yeah, must be a pretty I, fortified model. Yeah, and that's going to be very much vehicle dependent. Um, you know, a few years back, there was a million different modules, and then they went the other way and put everything in one big module. But when that module failed, they had to replace a big, expensive module. So they tend to go back and forth into how much they consolidate and how much they separate. Um, I think with a lot of these systems, I think we're going to see a mix of both not just because of a cost basis, but a reliability and maybe a safety basis. Maybe not have everything in one big box because if the big box fails, everything fails, but have things strategically um, separated and, and working, you know, a little more autonomous of each other so that they don't hurt each other if one of yeah. them failed. Yeah, there's so much stuff it's crazy. To, to read here. It's like amazing. Yeah, and that's on the production cars. Imagine what's out there in these concepts that are running around, you know, at a high level, not just a drawing on a board, cars that are driving down the road right now and have been for a while. Uh, there's stuff out there. And, and like I said, when I talked to Steve about uh, the next gen on this stuff, he says, you know, I can't talk about it, but they already know what it is. You know, they're working on it. They're, they're refining it and perfecting it. Goodness. I think it's Mike at the golf course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, my tee off time is exactly 2.30. So I'm still listening, but I'm also playing at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in a little bit, we could probably hear him cursing, too. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 club in the lake. Golf is where I get mellow. <laughs> So I haven't seen any other questions pop up from anybody, but, uh, you know, again, thanks for coming, everybody. We'll, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Thank thanks, you, Kurt. Very good everybody. job. Take Have care. fun, Mike. <laughs> okay. I'm going to stop you, the Kurt. recording.